so happy to be here. I uh, actually came and worked at Centennial Gardens for nine months back in uh, June of 2015. So it was nice to go around the garden to see what, what they've changed and what's going on. And this is such a beautiful garden, it really is. Okay, Margie, I don't know if we have our um, screen up. It went to sleep. Okay. Um, there we are, let's see. There you go. Okay, start slideshow. I don't have my glasses on. You want to start the slideshow for me? That's true. Go ahead. Thank you. So I just put some things together. Whether you're growing your roses singly, how many of you, that's all you have in your garden are roses? Raise your hands. I'm curious. One. But you have a lot of other plants. Bottom right. Bottom right. In your garden, so you use your roses as accents in the garden? Uh, left, right there. Thank you. <laughs> right. I don't know nothing about this stuff. With a little help from your friends. <laughs> okay. So, no matter if, whether you're growing one rose or you're growing a dozen roses, we always like to have companion plants with our flowers because roses are beautiful when the temperatures are cool in the spring and the fall rose bloom is so gorgeous. Um, I have to say that one rose that I learned here was the Beverly Rose and it is so fragrant and so beautiful and such a nice rose. I think my first rose that I ever grew, and y'all will appreciate this, was the Little Red Europeana. Does anyone know the Europeana? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I love that little rose. So, so I put together a list of plants that are really tough. And, and I don't want plants that you have to baby because we don't need that in our life at this point. We need to just plant some things and let them grow on their own. So our first group, and I have a handout that is with this program. So uh, if you didn't get one, we've got some more. Raise your hand if you need one. So the first group is like ground covers and creepers four to six inches, but right under a foot. Now, when you look at the strawberry fields, this is actually a chenille plant. Um, the, uh, when you let it, let's see, I think I have a little pointer on here. Yes, right there. So you can see this plant just covers the area that it's growing in, right? It can grow in full sun, it can grow in part shade, so you really wouldn't want to put this in a, in a garden unless you've got some way to contain it because it will be easier to maintain when you've got it contained. Otherwise, it's going to be crawling up your roses and covering them. You can use some steel edging, which bends very easily and make little beds, uh, little borders, using them in the garden to keep your strawberry fields contained. It flowers 10 months out of the year. It's evergreen. It used to freeze back when we were zone eight. You know, our USDA climatic zone has changed three times in 25 years because we were zone eight in 1985. In 1990, we became 8B. In the year 2000, we became 9A. And so a, B is actually warmer than A. So this plant is evergreen. It used to be evergreen up at Mercer. And I tell you, I've seen six 100 year floods in my 26 years at Mercer, and I'm really glad I missed the 800 year flood because I retired in 2011. And they got six feet of water in the visitor center, which they never had before. So now it's pretty devastating. But um, you know, when you, have, uh, when you have plants that grow so full and thick, what do you not see? What do you not see? Weeds, that is exactly right. And when you don't have any soil showing in your yard or in your flower beds, you will not have weeds. And you can use shrubs, you can use grasses, you can use any of these plants that we're gonna be talking about. I love the little Joseph's coats because they're short. They may freeze, but in kind of in, in protected areas, they can come back from the roots. And one of the things that I tell people is, if you have little annual or tropical plants that may freeze, working expanded shell into your soil actually helps build a bigger root system because it creates air spaces in the soil. 
and when you've got air spaces, you have a good root system with the expanded shale. Because as he was saying earlier, with all the rain that we've gotten, the soil has packed and we've lost all the air spaces in the soil. And the roots actually grow in the air spaces in the soil. So by working the expanded shale, if you're work, reworking your beds now, I highly recommend trying it. I know Franca has been working it in her beds, and you can talk to her about the response that she's gotten using expanded shale. And that kind of aeration and porosity in the soil will actually allow these plants to come back from the roots if they freeze. These are cute little plants. They stay, this one is maybe four inches. This is a little thread leaf. And this one actually kind of fills up a nice area with some copper foliage. In you know, liriope, I'm really not a fan of liriope, but carex, there are so many different varieties of carex coming on the market. And uh, I grow a lot of gingers at home, and of course the butterfly gingers, they have these really long stems, and they kind of have ugly legs in the garden. So it's just their rhizome on top of the ground with these big stems, and I like using these little carex at the base. It kind of just dresses it up. And we have like a morii here, ice cream here, and even a blue-leafed one called blue zinger. These guys can go underwater. They can be in heavy clay soil. They are evergreen, and you don't have to cut them back. They don't get the ugly, dead, brown grass look in the winter. And um, the Carex, there are, I bet we have probably 15 different varieties right now at the Arbor Gate because Carex is just such a wonderful, popular plant you can plant it in clay and you don't really have to do a lot of amending and it will actually grow and thrive. So they can work in the sun and they can also work in hard shade. Now the lantana, the species lantana montevidensis, this is actually growing off of a wall. You know when you plant the regular lantana, the yellow lantana or the Dallas red, it kind of gets really tall. Um, where the montevidensis comes in a purple and it also comes in a white. And it's really nice when you can mix the two together to see the contrasting and complementing of the two. And it actually grows and just kind of drips down. It doesn't have this billowing habit. As you can see it coming off of the wall, it just drips down. So it's one that's going to stay very low and right on the ground for you in the garden. All that's planted on the back side? It is the top. planted on the back side, dripping over, correct. Yeah. Shade. Full sun. Lantana wants full sun. And I don't know if anybody else has had this experience, but the regular lantanas have not performed well this year. Have y'all seen that? It's like they haven't bloomed well. Yeah, but before, even before the water. A lot of rain. It's not been dry. It's not been dry. And you know, one of the things too, if you're keeping your beds too wet, one of the first things to happen to plants is they quit blooming. And so this could be perennials, this could be annuals. And if people are, or grow snapdragons or they say they can't grow snapdragons, nine times out of 10, they're keeping the soil too wet because those like to be very dry. Um, this is a really great, one of those little, very tight ground hugging plants that can take wet areas. It is evergreen. It is probably less than two inches tall. You can use it in a flower bed. You can use it in between stepping stones. Um, and in, in shade, it's more green, but it flowers 10 months out of the year, maybe 11, depending on how long and how long we are warm. It's impossible to predict the weather now. Totally impossible. Once October is not cool anymore, everything's off and it's like, you know, our winters, we had, we had two winter days this year, and it was January, and it devastated the plants. Yeah. It killed it with a 50 degree temperature drop. This is a really cool plant that we started carrying at the Arbor Gate, and it is, if you're familiar with uh, Lobelia or cardinal flower, this is the same genus as the red cardinal flower, but this is actually a ground cover, and it can grow in a shaded wet area. And I took some home and planted it around my Dahoon Holly. It's actually on my neighbor's property because he waters so much. And I thought, okay, I can put the Dahoon Holly because it's going to grow and thrive in the wet. And then I can put this around it. And it was growing great with sun. 
And then all of a sudden it got a little fungus in it and I sprayed some jacanilla in it and it killed the fungus and the plant's growing again. This guy has the white flowers. It's been blooming all year. So this is a really nice, tight, little evergreen ground cover for a moist area. Of course, we always like to try to incorporate herbs that we use in the kitchen. And the marjoram is one of my favorite herbs. And I didn't even realize this, but there's actually two types of marjoram. There's actually an upright marjoram, and there's a creeping marjoram. Now, when you go to harvest this stuff, which one are you going to want to harvest? The upright one, because it's going to be so easy. The creeping one, you can actually have to pull it up out of the ground because it roots in. So if you've never had this recipe called Funky Spaghetti, which is Jamie Oliver's recipe, it is amazing, and it calls for sweet marjoram. And it's actually a vegetarian spaghetti where you take a bucket of yellow cherry tomatoes and a bucket of little red cherry tomatoes, a handful of basil, a handful of sweet marjoram, crush it all up, balsamic vinegar, and some olive oil with poured over angel hair pasta. It is so good. Um, Jamie Oliver's recipe, funky spaghetti, I just love that. The sweet marjoram is a key player in that recipe, and so I just love sweet marjoram. Now oregano, both of these plants are very evergreen, so when you have plants that have solid foliage, we don't have the sun baking on the soil, germinating weed seeds. So the more plants you can put in the garden that will spread and fill up, the less weeds you're going to have. And there are probably 15 different varieties of oregano. Uh, Beverly at the Arbor Gate has a really great selection of herbs that she carries year round. With the thyme, she probably has 20 different thymes, different oreganos, different rosemaries and lavenders. Um, so she has them year round, and sometimes it's hard to find herbs year round. Now I love, if you've got some shade, I love this little dwarf mondo grass. And this is down on Buffalo Bayou, and um, planted with bird nest ferns. They're actually really quite hardy in our winters. Um, but uh, this little mondo grass makes a nice little ground cover in part shade. It needs the shade, not full sun. Planting a low mounding plant that only gets tall when it blooms is like the Louisiana phlox. And it used to be so popular back when we had our plant sales at Mercer. Um, we would, it blooms in the spring, and when it's not blooming, it's just a low, full ground cover. And it blooms at once part shade. And as it grows around the trees, it doesn't need a lot of water. You know, we, we end up finding what plants can actually grow and thrive within the root systems of our big trees without constantly having to add soil on top of the tree roots, causing problems with the roots. So the Louisiana phlox does like growing around the base of trees. Now this little guy, if you've got a bunch of decomposed granite and you're trying to grow the pink buttons in between your stepping stones, this guy will reseed and starts reseeding everywhere. Okay, so even at the Arbor Gate, where on the benches they're made of wood and soil gets stuck in the cracks, these things have germinated in the cracks of the wood on the benches and growing off the benches. They just root in anywhere. You got to so, water your benches? Uh, well, yeah, the plants, uh, water was <laughs> under the benches for the flood. It, flo it flowed right on through. But this is, a, you know, when you have a space and you can't find anything that's going to work, you want to put one of these aggressive plants in there because it will slow it down, this area, whether it's bad soil or a bad location or very, very dry. You can put an aggressive plant in there, and it's not going to be aggressive because that, the environment, those conditions actually tame the beast, if you will. And so it is an evergreen. It flowers through the summer. In the winter, it gets when we have cold weather. I should say not winter, but when we have cold weather, the foliage turns bright red. So it has a really nice winter look. There's a trailing vinca. I love trailing vinca for the summer. It stays really low. Um, when you're working with vinca, you always want to use the varieties called Cora or Titan. The Cora or the Titan are resistant to the Phytophthora 
which is an aerial borne disease that kind of wipes out the vinca, you know, the, you'll plant them and all of a sudden the leaves will be clasping around the stem and the leaves will disappear and you're left with a skeleton. And that's Phytophthora, but the Titan and the Coras are resistant to that. Um, using them as a low ground cover, you can do them underneath the roses. This is a great plant to put in the summertime around the base of your roses because it will actually keep the soil cool. You know, the sun is so hot in June, July, and August, when, and your roses need at least six hours, so I'm sure you'll probably give them 10 hours, and we actually have probably 14 hours worth of sun from sun up to sundown if you, if you have that kind of exposure. But these plants stay low and they stay flat. And you can always tell, it's always gonna have the name Cascade. And the Cascade means spreading, okay? Now the Zinnia linearis is another low one. It's a little bit taller than the Vinca is. Um, and it likes to be a little drier. I mean, the Vinca, of course, can be very dry as well. Overhead watering um, will cause zinnias to start getting powdery mildew. Just these two cool weeks that we have. I have a vinca in a pot, not a vinca, but a zinnia, a beautiful zinnia in a pot. Just these two weeks of cool nights, I have powdery mildew all over my zinnia already. Just from those very few cool nights that we just had. That's the big flowered zinnias. These are a little bit more resistant to it but these only get four to six inches, and they really do offer a whole lot of color and very <laughs> drought tolerant. So along with your roses, it's nice to put things in that are seasonal, that come up at different times of the year and surprise you, because we forget from one season to the next that we had planted that there, and then all of a sudden we have a bloom, and it's, it's this bud is for you, and it comes up and it puts a smile on your face, so the things that bloom right now, and especially after the hurricane, are the hurricane lilies. And believe it or not, this red one especially, after Hurricane Ike at Mercer, that was my last hurricane there, as I'm stomping through the berms and kind of assessing all the water and the damage, these guys were just blooming everywhere. They come up and they flower before there's any foliage, um, like Horus is the genus, radiata is the red, and aria is the yellow. The foliage on the aria actually looks like a spider plant with the wide green blade. This one, when you plant the bulbs, it may be three years before you get a bloom on the red, but you plant the yellow and you're gonna have bloom that year. So it doesn't need to be compact or tight, <coughs> and the red does. So these guys can actually grow in sun or part shade. And when we used to go running and doing um, kind of a bulb, we'd go to abandoned homes, abandoned homesteads up in East Texas, you'll find these like Horus, the red ones, blooming in a row. And you knew there was a walkway there, and there was a house there, but there wasn't anything left. So when the house is, the people are gone, the house is gone, the like Horus are still blooming. It's still marking the path for where they were. Now this is another very cool little amaryllis flower, and it's called the schoolhouse lily, meaning that it blooms in September when the kids go back to school. And it flowers before any foliage comes up. And you have red versions and you have pink versions. And so the, fol the flowers will bloom in September, then it'll be followed up by foliage. Um, the foliage will kind of last all winter and die down when it gets hot. And I love this one. This looks like an asteroid or some type of steer, uh, the blood lilies. These used to bloom only in the fall, but it seems like the weather has kind of triggered them to where they can bloom twice a year. I've seen them blooming in the spring and in the fall. They have a really wide blade. Um, and, and kind of a general rule of thumb, how deep do you plant a bulb? Well, instead of reading all the tags and all the misinformation that's out there, I just kind of use this tip where if you've got a bulb and it is one and a half inches from the bottom of the bulb to the top of the bulb, I would plant it, I would double that depth and plant it three inches from the bottom of the bulb to the top of the soil. So if your bulbs are one inch, you're gonna bury them two inches. And so you can kind of use that guide with your narcissus, 
your daffodils, not your perennial ones, not your amaryllis, agapanthus, and crinum, because you'll plant those in a different way. But the ones that are seasonal, you kind of plant them twice the depth. So wait, you plant twice the depth of the size of the Of the size of the bulb, okay. right. And that would be like your narcissus, your snowdrops, your uh, daffodils, um, Dutch iris, um, probably, like these are planted too high in the pots. A lot of times we do this with amaryllis, but you really want to bring the soil up to, I call it the neck and the shoulders of the bulb. The shoulders are where the bulb comes up around and then the neck starts. So if it were me, I would bury these up to here because this, they, they can't, they only have a few roots underneath. And even in the garden, that's how I would plant them, is just because the foliage pretty much stays up during the growing season. And if they stay up, the foliage stays up during the growing season, then I can look at them as a perennial bulb and not just a seasonal bulb. Does that make sense? So bring it to the top of, bring the soil about to the top of the shoulders. The yes, bulb. the shoulders, right. Right where the neck is gonna go up. And you would do the same thing for agapanthus, amaryllis, and crinum. Do you do the same thing for tulips? Tulips, you are an adventurer, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> They're wonderful. Our climate certainly makes it challenging to grow tulips. Yeah. You, you buy them when they become available, and you put them in a paper sack, and you put them in your refrigerator because they need to stay chilled. And after, I tell everybody, after New Year's Day, go out in the garden and work off all that holiday eating by planting all of your tulip bulbs, and they're gonna be planted six inches deep. And we have to plant tulips that deep because as soon as they hit the ground, they start growing. And so by burying them deeper, and you've got to have well-drained soil, which I know you do, by burying them deeper, it takes longer for them to come up because a lot of times with tulips, because we've gotten so warm in the winter that you'll have three leaves that'll come up and just come up maybe two inches above the soil, and there's your flower sitting right in the middle of it. And that's very frustrating when you spend all the money to buy the bulbs and all the labor to put it in and you're not getting a good show, but you can actually force them by using like a granular triple, like a 1500 or a 2100 and just hit it with straight nitrogen. And guess what? It sends those shoots right up with the flowers. So that's how, that's kind of the tricks that I've learned with the tulips. Now there are little, some little species tulips that will actually come back year after year, like the peppermint tulip, and you get 25 bulbs and you put them all in one clump and they only get about this tall. And the peppermints are red and white striped buds, and then the chrysanthas are yellow and red striped buds. So. Those do very, those will naturalize for us, and that means come back year after year. Yes, ma'am. How long do you have to refrigerate them? Until after January the 1st. So when they, because when they, we have some that we inherited from Longwood Garden, no less. Oh, wow. Um, how, what have you been, how have you been keeping them? Just, they're just in a bag right now. In, outside in a garage, yeah. or? Well, the garage is too hot, we've just been Inside, the house. okay, because the humidity is being taken out of the air. So they're just in a bag right now. So maybe October, put them in. Have, put them. You want to put them in the refrigerator before they start sprouting. Okay. And and mark the bag because my mom used to put her tulips <laughs> in the bag in the not don't we don't do plastic we do paper and put them in the crisper. And she came home one day, and Dad was chopping them up and sauteing them. So you want to make sure that you mark them when you put them in, in, the, in the refrigerator. Six inches. The six so. inches is from the bottom or the top? Ma'am? Six inches from the bottom? From the very bottom of the hole to the top of the soil. What would be cooking? Lord knows. <laughs> Lord knows. Lord knows. Lord knows. He was being creative. <laughs> yes, Susan. Do you put that fertilizer in the hole or just 
working into the You know, um, there's several different schools of thought on that. A lot of people will put bone meal down in the hole. Some people do blood meal, but all that does is kind of bring all the critters all to your yard when you put the blood meal in there. I'm kind of like of the mindset that the bulbs actually have everything they need to get started. And then I just, we just plant them. And then when we started seeing the green noses come up, that's when I come out and fertilize to give them something else once the foliage is up. You know, and you want to put them close together um, so that you actually have like a bouquet of flowers coming up in the garden instead of doing a line and they look like soldiers ready to be shot on the firing line. So we kind of want to group them together in a mass and then space and then a mass because you get a lot more impact with it. Yes, sir. After they bloom, can you dig them back up and put them back in the refrigerator? We don't have the right climate for that. I would say I would leave them unless you're going to go back in with another flower to replace them. Um, but normally, I mean, they grow in Holland and they naturalize there, and that's one of the coldest places. And so you could leave some, they may rot, but they're gonna be so deep into the soil they may come back up, who knows? But no, normally they're an annual. It's a one-shot deal. They're not gonna be, get enough energy in the ground in our growing season to be able to bloom beautiful again. And it's the same thing with the hyacinths. The hyacinths have to be kept with the tulips and planted at the same time. Um, kept in the refrigerator and planted in January um, with the hyacinths. And they need to be six inches deep also. Okay, the rain lilies, uh, there's a lot of different varieties of rain lilies. And I love this one because it's so well behaved. It does not reseed. Because once you get some of those seedy, weedy ones, I mean, they're coming up everywhere in your garden. Um, this one spreads underground, and it always is a fall bloomer. And it's Zephyranthus candida, the fall blooming white rain lily. Now, if you've got rain lilies and they're making seeds, you want to, when that seed capsule is just swollen and you know it's fixing to pop, break it off and sprinkle those seeds in your lawn. Just kind of break them off and put them in your lawn. And then one day you'll drive up in your driveway and there'll be a little flower there smiling. And it'll remind you that, oh, I put those seeds there. It can take a while, but that's the best way to kind of disperse the seeds is put them in the lawn. So spring flowering bulbs are the amaryllis. And I just love amaryllis. I think they are so wonderful. It's like, did you have a question? Are you stretching? OK. Um, people ask me, what's your favorite plant? I said, what season are we in? Because when it's amaryllis season, amaryllis are my favorite bulbs because there's so many different ones. And they're lovely. And, you know, to force them, to put them in a pot and give them as gifts at Christmas time, a gardener is, would love a, a, a forced amaryllis for a, a present, for a prize, for something to say you're special. And you know, the cool thing about giving plants to people is that every time that plant blooms in their garden, they always are going to think of you. And so that's, there's a lot of special emotion attached to that. Now this is the little painted petals, and this is a, a little plant that it's in the iris family, and it has the most gorgeous coral colored flowers. And this is all the foliage here. There's actually Blotillas um, growing here, um, which is the ground orchid. They come up in the spring. The foliage comes up in the spring. They flower. They produce seed. And then they die down. And so they're like gone from the summer until the spring again. And so this is a wonderful little plant that will come up and be there for about four months. And then it goes back to sleep. It makes corms and it also makes seed. Now daffodils are, um, the difference between a daffodil and a narcissus is a daffodil has a single flower on a single stalk. A narcissus has a cluster of flowers on a single stalk. 
So that's kind of like the easy way to kind of know the difference between a daffodil and a narcissus. But the Latin name, they're all called narcissus, but we refer to them as daffodil and narcissus. These are two varieties that really love Houston, that naturalize very well. The Ice Follies has got a white perianth with a yellow cup, and the Fortune's got a yellow perianth with an orange cup. And with your daffodils, um, they come up and they bloom in the spring. And when we use our bulbs, in our, our spring blooming bulbs in the garden, we have the advantage of having foliage in the space where you have the bulbs all winter long. So it's not like they just come up and bloom in the spring. You actually have this wonderful cluster of, of sword-like foliage from the bulbs. Now this is one of the best bulbs, I tell you. It will grow in wet clay. It will grow in a well-drained bed. We can't grow lily of the valley, but we can grow something that reminds us of lily of the valley, but it's not fragrant. And you have the, this, this particular bulb. It, the foliage looks blue-green here, but when it first comes up, it is one of the darkest green foliage on the bulbs that there is and they just come up and they bloom and they die down. And the best time to divide them is when they're pushing their noses up. You can go in, you can dig them, you can spread them, separate them, and replant them in other areas, and they won't miss a beat at that point. If you wait it until after they bloom, they're going dormant, where if you can transplant them before they get going, then you're gonna have the best bang for your buck doing it that way. Now the Narcissus, this is Grand Primo, which is one of the really old varieties. And um, this is another benchmark. When you're going out uh, botanizing for bulbs in February in East Texas, you'll always find Grand Primo coming up in clumps. They pull themselves so deep into the soil that when you go to liberate some, when you put your shovel in the soil and you think you're far enough down to lift them out, Pull it out and go down another foot past that because you will decapitate them. They are like crinums and they have this contractile roots that just pulls the bulbs down in the ground. And when you dig them up, you can't believe they're growing in that much clay and they're not rotting. Uh, but the early cheer is the double version of the Grand Primo. And if you ever go to Bayou Bend Gardens in the spring and do the Azalea Trail, you will see early cheer. This is the only Narcissus that they have at Bayou Bend. Now your Dutch iris are, will naturalize. You plant a large group of them. You kind of space them like maybe one, one to two inches apart. I like to kind of work my whole area and then just take the bulbs and, <coughs> and space them out and then push them down with my fingers when I get them all where they want to be. And I normally like to do at least 12 because we want to have a bouquet of flowers and not a line of flowers. And so you have many different uh, bicolors. They, the Dutch iris don't have a beard. This is where the beard would be. So it's very smooth. So your Dutch iris has got kind of this wiry foliage and very typical of the bulbs. So your summer flowering uh, bulbs of course, caladiums are probably one of our best shade and sun bulbs that grow from April until we get that first cool front. And that could be November, it could be December. Um, the first blue northerner used to make them lay down. Now, there's a little trick with your caladiums. There's full sun caladiums and there's shade caladiums. And the way that you tell the full sun ones is the stem, the petiole that attaches the leaf to the bulb, is always right at the tip of the leaf. Your strap leaves are your sun caladiums. So your stem is going to come up and it's going to attach itself to the very back of the leaf. So that is a sun caladium. Your shade caladiums, your fancy leaves, they look like hearts. And the stem, here's the leaf, the stem comes in in the middle of the leaf, kind of one top, uh, one third of the way down, where your strap, the stem is going to come in at the very top, and those can take more sun. So it's always nice to know that little trick. Okay, so lilies 
I love lilies. Okay, from amaryllis, we go to lilies because they bloom a little later. I like to give the lilies a little bit of shade because we're starting to get hot when the lilies are blooming. And if they get a little bit of shade, those flowers are going to last a little longer. Um, the orientals are the fragrant ones. They are like the stargazer. And the Asiaticans have no fragrance. They multiply. They come back every year. Uh, I, I'm partial to orientals because of the wonderful fragrance. This is actually a hybrid um, triumphator. Some people can't ever remember the name, and they come into the garden center, and they say, I need some of those terminator lilies. Well, I'll know what you're talking about when you come in asking for terminator lilies. This lily multiplies by bulb. It produces bulbs on the stem. The flower itself, can, the stem can be five to six feet tall. This is such an awesome lily, and it is fragrant. Okay, so our fall blooming asters, um, they will bloom in the fall, they'll bloom in the spring. These guys, like Professor Kippenberg, is a short one. It's about, you know, 12 inches. The Fricardii monk. We had some in the perennial borders out here, but I don't think this variety really likes us here because we don't get cold enough. It doesn't get to rest. Of course, our winter perennials are our columbines. Columbines are, just have wonderful foliage in the garden. They actually die down in the heat. They will come back. This is our golden hinkleys. Then you have these that are more of the European. They look like a honeycomb and then like a spring magic, but their flowers are spurred. And when you put these guys in the ground, they easily can get 16 to 18 inches across. I mean, one plant can get quite large. So give it plenty of space and uh, not full sun, but half day sun. Our other fall bloomer is the Philippine violet. And this is the one that actually produces flowers in the axles of the plant. So when you're growing this green plant all year long, you want to keep pruning it so it keeps getting fuller and fuller. If you don't prune it, you'll have two stalks that grow straight up and you'll only have flowers on two stalks. If you cut those stalks back, those two stalks turn into five or seven stalks. And the more stalks you have, the more flowers you have. It can take full sun. Uh, and it also comes in a white. Now, this is a great one to put in your garden because it is such a nice, it's, it's, it's a considerate perennial. It, um, a lot of times you'll put perennials in your garden and they'll run over each other. And one will smother the other one. Well, this one, this one is so nice. You put it in and it puts out this arm and it actually kind of weaves itself in between your other plants and doesn't smother them. And it fills up space and we don't have weeds. And it is perennial, it, the butterflies love it, the foliage has a nice fruity fragrance to it, and it makes these little seeds, and it's not a seedy, weedy plant either. So the Brazilian button flower is just a really wonderful, its height is probably gonna be 16 inches maybe, 14 to 16 inches tall. Full sun, part shade, no pest problems, easy to propagate, um, this is just a great plant. And if you want uh, hummingbirds, if I had to pick a kufia, a cigar plant, this one right here wins the prize over and over, the David Verity, because it gets four feet tall, it grows in a, a vase shape. So it's very nice, it's not a big fat round ball that's just gonna smother everything around it. It grows up in a vase, allows you to grow things up underneath it, and besides David Verity, they came out with an improvement of David Verity, and it's called Vermillionaire. Okay, so Vermillionaire has got twice the amount of flowers on it that David Verity has. And the hummingbirds are very territorial, so they will fight over these plants. So you've got to have at least two or three plants in the garden if you have the hummingbirds because they're going to pick their favorite plant. Another hummingbird plant is the Leonotus, and it is a fall bloomer. Um, there's the Leonotus leonoris, and then a mythifolia. Um, they send up these world, f world flowers. Fall bloomer, um, full sun. 
I saw them blooming in California and they were beautiful in California and they don't get that beautiful here. Maybe it's our soil that's so heavy um, and maybe work an expanded shell and the soil will kind of make the plant much bigger than, than it normally gets. Um, this is one of our little native pinstamens, the Gulf Coast pinstamen. Pinstamen tenuous and it's always nice. Being at Mercer, we had to find plants that could go into water for two to three days and survive when the water receded and then have all that sand and silt and everything on them. This pinstamen is one of those. It is tough, it can grow in full sun, it can grow in shade, it can grow in wet, and it can grow in dry. So it is kind of a really well-adapted plant um, it is an evergreen. When it's not blooming, it's just a beautiful rosette of foliage um, and many clusters of these tiny little purple flowers. Of course, we love our old-fashioned garden flocks. And the one that Greg Grant always promotes is John Fannett flocks because it has a eye, a dark pink purple eye. More of a, a lighter color flower with a dark purple eye. And John Fannix is from Fannix Nursery in San Antonio. He introduced a lot of um, selected forms of plants out of that nursery. And Bill Welch always talks about the Texas peak. This is a great butterfly nectar plant. These guys, you want to have nice loose soil because they actually will spread underground with stolen. So one patch could turn into a bigger patch, could turn into a bigger patch. And that's really good because and they want to be in part shade. They don't want full sun. So put them in part shade, and they are quite fragrant. The, uh, this is a tropical plant that's really kind of worked its way into the shade gardens because it is tough. Um, it's, it's very unique. There's the tricolor version, and it's much smaller than the large one. Um, it's also called Moses in the Bow because it makes this funky little flower down deep. Um, the oyster plant is another common name for it, but it's Roeos fapacea, and uh, you would kind of use it maybe even as a spiky looking plant, but it's very soft. It does, has no thorns and has a nice thick stem, so it is a nice accent plant for the shade garden. And my most favorite, Black Eyed Susan, there's a lot of different ones out there, but when we get a lot of rain, they die. This one does not. This is the winner, the Rebecca Goldstrom. It can be underwater and it can be dry. It doesn't care and it can all be in the same month. It doesn't care. Um, the Rebecca Goldstrom grows as a rosette all winter long. The butterflies love this plant. Um, what's different with this one, it doesn't have that really hairy leaf like the here to the Rebecca here to does. So, if you want a black-eyed Susan that's going to be there forever, you actually end up digging it up and dividing it and replanting it because it is such a wonderful plant. Now, one of the things when you're growing the asters, I always like to put a slide up because when you see, um, this is a, like a witch's broom. This is called aster yellow. When you see this happening on your cone flowers, your black-eyed Susans, you need to pull those plants up and destroy them because this is actually a virus that's passed by a, uh, a plant lice that actually is a rasping, sucking insect. And so if you have it in your garden, it is not a different variety. It is not a unique thing. It is something that needs to be pulled up and destroyed. I've seen it more on the Indian summers and on the cone flowers, but I've not seen it on the Rebecca Bolstrom. But I'd just like to have this picture to share information. So we, we like to know when things are sick so that we can keep it from spreading in our garden. So that is it. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much.